Hello, and welcome to ASUG Presents. My name is David Wascom. I'm part of the ASUG leadership team, and I'm looking forward to being your moderator for this series focused on supply chain and turning your SAP solution into an asset to help you get the most from your SAP technology investment. This series will feature thought leadership, solution overviews, and insights shared by experts at Reveal. Reveal is a longtime ASUG partner and has been helping our members understand and optimize their SAP supply chain solutions for many years. Throughout this series, we will be taking deeper dives on everything from manufacturing and operational excellence, inventory optimization, and inventory planning. We will then conclude the series with an in-depth discussion with a fellow ASUG member as they explain how they have been able to turn their SAP solutions into real assets for their business and optimize how they manage their supply chain. To kick off the series today, I am joined by Martin Rowan, Managing Partner at Reveal. Martin has been a thought leader around supply chain for over 20 years and brings a wealth of experience and insights to us today. Martin and I are going to spend time today discussing what Martin and his team at Reveal see happening with companies as they manage through the challenges in today's supply chain environment. Now, before we get started today, I do want to cover a couple of housekeeping items to help you get the most from this series. The ASUG Presents format provides a unique opportunity for you, the attendee, to be part of the discussion. The presentations throughout this series are pre-recorded. However, for each session, the presenters are also online live in the session chat. This means that you can engage the speakers in a live chat while the presentation is taking place. This provides you a fantastic opportunity to ask questions, dig deeper into a comment, or share your own perspective on the topics being covered during the session. So on behalf of ASUG, our leadership team, and our members, let's get this series started. All right. Well, Martin, great to be here in person today. It's something we've not had an opportunity to do the last couple of years. And so no to, to be able to actually sit in a room with somebody is a really fantastic experience again. Uh, so thank you for your time today, and thank you for bringing your expertise and your team's expertise to this series of conversations we're going to be having. Ah, you're so welcome, David. So nice being together again, for sure. Fantastic. So what I'd like to do before we really get into the meat of our conversation today and, and, and look forward at the next few events that we have, I want to get a little bit more information about your company, about Reveal. So if you would kind of give us a, a, a quick uh, overview of, of who Reveal is, your relationship to Reveal, and, and why we're having this conversation today. Yeah, firstly, thank you so much again. I, I think it's, firstly, just to be together face to face like this. I think as human beings, we need to miss these connections. So it's so good to do that. Yeah, so as you mentioned, you know, I'm a, one of the co-founders of Reveal and Reveal's been unique in a, in a way that it's found a niche in the business where most people are very focused on getting the transactions up and running and go live. And then what happens is people then kind of abandon the system or abandon the team and say, now go run your business. And most people don't know how to do that. And so that's kind of where we fit into it. And I, what I think is so amazing about the relationship is that if you think of what ASUG's mission is around maximizing the SAP system to benefit your business, that's exactly what we do is how do we actually take companies through this level of maturity to get them to the other side? So pretty excited. And of course, in the last few years with supply chain disruptions, we've had quite a fun ride for sure. Fantastic. Now that's a, that's a very different message than you hear from, I'll say the typical partner, right? It's, uh, and I've been, I was a CIO for a number of years, an SAP customer for a number of years. So I've been on the other side of that equation, right? But to, but to have somebody says, really my, my role is to help you maximize the value of what you have. You know, what I didn't hear in your description was, I'm looking for you to make more more I in the ROI equation. I want to help you get more RO is what I'm hearing, which right. is a fantastic message, right? And very appealing to to me as a customer and, and to our members. Yeah, and I, I love the topic of today too, because we're going to be talking a bit about how do we see SAP as an asset? So I almost want to turn it from an ROI to an ROA, right? What's the return on this asset? And and I agree, it is it is such an exciting space to be in because not only is the world changing out there, SAP is changing, the technology is changing, you know, there's some really cool stuff on the horizon, uh, but there's some fundamentals that need to be addressed. And so I think that there's a, a really cool space to be in right now, specifically within the transition of SAP going to S4HANA as well. So Martin, so let's, let's go ahead and jump into the conversation about supply chain, right? There's been fundamental changes over the last, depending on what scope you want to draw on this last five years, last 10 years, last 100 years, as you know, technology and, and society has changed to be able to support 
larger and more global supply chains, right? But the last two years, two and a half years in particular, have been a big challenge for everybody because of COVID, right? And there we were, what, five minutes into the conversation, and there's the first time we brought up the C word. <laughs> um, but that's an, that's an important part of, of, right. of who we are as a society and who we are as businesses and being able to uh, execute business together, right? So I want to start around the COVID idea. And, and what have you seen have been the big impacts from a COVID standpoint on supply chain? Yeah, that's, I mean, obviously it's had, this Black Swan event has had a big impact. I think what we're going to find if we explore this further, there's been a many actual disruptions mm -hmm. throughout. But, but before we do that, let me, let me take a moment to just kind of define supply chain because typically organizations and people think of supply chain either as just my logistics department, mm -hmm. the guys moving the product around, or just my purchasing department. When we talk supply chain and the more um, traditional discipline around supply chain is end-to-end, -end, customer all the way through supplier. So for my raw materials, running through my operations, adding value all the way through to my customer. And then of course, to be able to add all the ancillary processes around it, like planning and execution, strategy, quality, plant maintenance, et cetera. So that's kind of the core of most businesses. If you make, sell, distribute a product, you're a supply chain, right? Or you have one, right? Um, so that's the key thing. And I think one of the, one of my favorite things to think about when you think of the, the pandemic outside of the human toll, of course, right? is that for the first time, everybody now knows what a supply chain is. Uh, I, I they may not like it. They may not like it. You know, they didn't get their toilet paper, they didn't get yeah. their whatever. But even grandma now knows what, yeah. you know, what, what a supply chain is, right? And I think that's been a, a big shift for, for organizations. I mean, there's statistics out there that says Gartner did some assessments pre-COVID and said, so how many CEOs see supply chain as a strategic advantage? And Less than 40% were saying it is really a strategic advantage. It was more just a process, right? It's something we do. Um, worse, most of them um, were doing and saying that it was a cost center. It wasn't even like necessarily a, comp you know, not even a competitive advantage, but actually a profit center, right? And I think that, that has shifted big time, right? Uh, because when, if you think of the theory of constraints, if suddenly your supply chain is the constraint, then all the focus is on that, right? Then suddenly you go, well, hang on, I need to actually unlock the potential and value out of that. And so I think the pandemic, if anything, outside of the awareness, it's created focus and it's created a strategic rise of what the, what COVID, sorry, what the supply chain actually is. Absolutely. Yeah, I've, yeah, I've said, actually, you know, set aside the, the human tragedy and, I, and you know, we can't overlook what that has been for the last two years for the world, right? But uh, that aside, I think that as we look now and certainly as we look in the future looking back, COVID is gonna be a, a big catalyzing event for a lot of change in the economy, right? And how we how we do business with each other, how we work, right? The whole concept of work from home and in the hybrid work environment. Two years ago, that was a very fringe solution for businesses where now it's become very mainstream. And so managing through what, how the world has changed as a result of COVID, it's not gonna go away just because we say, hey, the pandemic's over, Let's go back to 2019 again. Not happening. Right. Yeah, and I would add to that. I think one of the things people didn't realize with supply chains is, is that you can take some functions remotely, but there were a significant amount you couldn't. I mean, when you're manufacturing something, somebody's still actually working on a machine. You couldn't suddenly just say, okay, well, you can do that from home. And so there was a real adjustment. It wasn't just like, how do we shift to a remote workforce? It was how do we shift to a hybrid workforce where we've got remote and physical and that was a big challenge for a lot of people and Absolutely. those that weren't using SAP to the extent that they can you know the maximizing like we talked about really struggled with that they really kind of felt the grind through that right so let's let's kind of dig down into the, the nuts and bolts of this so what what has changed specifically around supply chain in the last couple of years mm -hmm. yeah I would say a, a few things have changed right and I and I, and I want to start off by um, saying you know from a supply chain perspective it's also important to understand that not only the last two years right and I want to use an, a story around that if you think of Kodak famous company started in the 80s I think 1880 um, and uh, bankrupt in 2012 filed for bankruptcy and the predominant thing that people would typically say is, yeah, they never really adjusted to the digital side of things. But that's not true. 
you know, they actually discovered the first digital photography back in the 70s, 75-ish time frame. But they suppressed that technology because, you know, at that point in time, their physical supply chain was about printing photos. And so they developed this entire supply chain around the physical production of photos. And then, of course, with the advent of digital and digital photos, they started quickly wrapping their model around, well, how do we take the digital photo and print them, yep. right? And so they wanted to maximize their physical supply chain that they had invested in for the last 100 years, et cetera. And they, what they missed was the fact that it actually had very little to do with taking the digital picture and then making a physical copy of it. It was that people wanted to share it. And so when Facebook came onto the picture, within you know, five or six years, Kodak filed for bankruptcy because it just became a much easier way to distribute photos. And that's the discussion around the digital supply chain versus the physical supply chain. And I think what's happened with the COVID over the last few years um, is, is that I think more and more people are understanding that. Um, you know, if you think of business models that have changed over the years, Kaiser's a good example, the air compressor company, right? They would actually sell air compression machines and then maintain them and then go out and do it. That would be a revenue stream as well. And then uh, pre-COVID, actually, they discovered that there's a more lucrative process around selling compressed air, right. right? And so then you put down the equipment, you support it, but you're selling it on a SaaS kind of model, right? And I think those business models just were accelerated through COVID. People started going, well, hang on, I need to do something different. So not only did we raise the visibility of supply chains and realize, hang on, this is a strategic advantage. We can do something about it. But then it actually helped us change some of the business models that exist. And it's, it's like Y2K, no different. Y2K, everybody knew that they needed to go to a single source of truth and not deal with a single source of ERP. But there was no like event driving it mm -hmm. until somebody said, hey, do you know that we're going to run out of date issues <laughs> at the end of the century? And then suddenly it took off, yeah. right? And the same thing with COVID. I think it accelerated the state that we're in right now. Exactly. Now, what is that catalyzing event that's going to drive that? Correct. Correct. Because, you know, I can tell you again, I came out of, uh, out of wholesale distribution, which is clearly right in the heart of supply chain. Right. And, you know, there were things that we had considered doing uh, when I was still uh, running as a CIO that, you know, just never made it to the top of the list, right? There were, you know, but, you know, to your point, it was more kind of a cost center. It's part of the price of doing business. And we were very conscientious about that because that, that was who we were, right? Was that supply, that logistics and supply component. And so we were very conscientious about how everything we did affected our cost and how it affected our operating efficiency. But even in a situation like that, there were things that, that we could have done better that, again, just never made that priority list. Yeah. Um, and it's funny, you know, you share kind of from a business model standpoint, another, uh, another Eastman story. Uh, the Eastman Chemical, actually, uh, they had invented uh, back a few decades ago now, uh, a very, very strong, very fast curing adhesive that they couldn't figure out a market for. And so they sold it to another company. And uh, what the other company did was literally they just changed the packaging during it. So instead of trying to ship it by the rail car, which is how Eastman Chemical was right. used to shipping products, they put it in a little 10 gram container, called it crazy glue. <laughs> and everybody knows what crazy glue is, right? right? <laughs> uh, and so it was just a matter of kind of the how, you know, what's the use case for, for this product that we have? You know, post-it notes, same kind of thing, right? Hey, it was a mistake. I mean, we figured out a way to right. turn it into a product. So Yeah. It's, it's those catalyzing events, right? Is can we see the creativity out? And I think as we talk through this a little further, I think as we think about SAP in particular, and we think of how do we become resilient and agile supply chains, we're going to talk a bit about, I think, how we can actually apply that more practically so that they aren't accidental uh, fines, right? They're actually defined fines and uh, defined opportunities. So you brought up an interesting two terms, right? I want to unpack these a little bit, right? The idea of resiliency and agility. Right. They, they tend to get used, certainly they get used a lot together, and sometimes they get used interchangeably, but they're not the same thing. Right. And so if you would, I'd like to unpack resiliency and agility for the audience today. Absolutely. I, I think that is so key because if you think of resiliency, and this is where most people get caught up on the whole definition of the two is that resiliency by definition means I'm going to bounce back to where I was you know so if you think of you know some disruption and you're dealing with it and then you work really hard to kind of get back to what you were um, that's resiliency right uh, the challenge with that is that it's timely it takes a lot of time it takes a lot of cost a lot of effort 
to kind of move yourself back to that. So resiliency at the end of the day um, is probably good, is a good supply chain. If you can be resilient, you're probably a good supply chain. However, we would argue that if you're an agile supply chain, you're a great supply chain because now you're actually dealing, you're kind of riding the wave of change if you want. You're actually adapting and it's much smaller increments, it's a continuous improvement, it's trying to fail fast, succeed fast and see what works and doesn't work. And uh, obviously you need to have a platform, a technology platform that can do that uh, for you to do that. And I think that is so key because people are so focused on resilience. Even if you listen to the news, they're always talking about a resilient supply chain. Yeah, that's just good. We need to be able to address great right now and be agile. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk about sales and operations planning, you know, IBP now, integrated business planning, not the software, the process, right? And over the years, it's all about how this is looking forward and how this is going to drive optimization within the process. But I think something that's key that's been missed uh, throughout this entire kind of this conversation is something called SNOE, right? And it's, uh, that's sales and operations execution, right? Because if you want agility, you're going to need to be able to take that plan that's going to be disrupted down the road and be agile along the way. And you need sales and operations execution to do that. That is that constant agility, constant change. And I think that's a, a missing ingredient with most companies that haven't made that switch to great yet. So, and that's an interesting point, right? Because you know, the best planning solution in the world is ultimately only as good as your ability to execute on what it says to do. Right. Uh, and so let's unpack that a little bit and understand, you know, right, what are things that companies can be doing to, to adopt that more agile mindset, right? Not only from a planning, but from an execution standpoint. You know, what are you seeing with your customers? What are, what are you seeing in the industry? Well, I, I think, let me take a step back on that because okay, I, sure. think, I think that's a fabulous question, but I think we need to set kind of a stage as to how you define agility from a system perspective, right? And if you look on the screen, uh, we put up uh, one of our maturity continuums that we've used in the past to help people understand this, right? So. If you think of um, a five level maturity, five being obviously the highest level of maturity, uh, it's the maturity of the use of the technology to meet my business goals. So if my business goals is to be agile and adjust, I want to be able to use a system in a way that I can do that, right? And so when you think of agility, you gotta start thinking about where do you stand on this continuum? Because if you're kind of in one, you're in a state where your system's not really even functioning the way it's supposed to. So if that's the case, you can't really be very agile, right? And so if you think of this continuum, it's kind of like the system's doing what it's supposed to do, level one. You trust the data, it's level two. I have the ability to literally adjust my rules to reflect reality, that's level three. Four is I'm actually taking those rules and optimizing it to the point where my supply chain or my business, frankly, is able to adjust. And then, of course, five is I'm actually achieving some real business value out of this system and this technology. And I think um, what people don't understand is, is that when we come to discussing agility and how we get to that point, I think people lose the fact that they haven't really clearly articulated themselves on this continuum. They haven't been honest enough about it. And it depends on who you ask, right? Often if you ask the CIO, um, he may have a slight bias towards implementing the software right, and feeling right. pretty proud of it. So he may say, hey, look, yeah, we're typically on the higher end of the use of the tool. You go ask the planner, the buyer, or the shop floor guy, and he's like, wow, I'm using a bunch of spreadsheets. You know, I'm a, more of a spreadsheet jockey than a SAP kind of user, right? Um, and I think that's really key. And if you, if you continue through that screen thinking, right, and you look at the next screen, you'll see that I think you, you mature as an organization towards that four and five state. That's where agility kicks in. And that's really important because if you kind of find yourself in that first three, if you want, you're pretty much doing what every business is doing out there. It's all about quality, it's about cost, it's about delivery. It's all I need to do. I'm just doing at the best quality, at the lowest cost of the highest delivery capability. When you switch to four and five, and you're agile, you're, you have flexibility, you're introducing innovation and velocity. And so that is so critical. But how do you do that with SAP? That's the key. Now, everybody seems to think that 
I can only do that when I'm on S4. Uh, the sad part is, is that if you take where you're at right now, let's say you're in one, two, or three, and you move to S4, and you haven't really addressed the, the challenges, the behaviors, the bad data, all the other stuff we talk about, you're just accelerating chaos. You're just making it faster, especially with MRP Live, it's just gonna feel like it's just overwhelming. So the question always is, do you do something ahead of time? Do you do something post it? How do I become more agile? Do I, do I care to be agile? And I think this will help the audience a lot in being able to start kind of pinpointing where they're at. Yeah, you, you made a, a really interesting point. You actually made several interesting points I want to kind of go back and visit. But the, the, the point about uh, you know, adopting S4 as a, as a platform to, to execute your business upon, right. that does not somehow magically make you a more transformative, more uh, innovative uh, company, right? It gives you a fantastic platform upon which to innovate and upon which to transform your business. But it doesn't... You know, it's not like you, hey, we, we went live on Friday and we came in on Monday. We were a very different organization. Uh, there is more to it than that. And, and it's easy to lose sight of that sometimes from the technologist standpoint. Yeah, I, I, I can agree with you more. I mean, it, it, I find it fascinating that, you know, through the 80s and 90s and now into the 21st century, how that principle was lost on people. You know, yeah, my, the way to solve this problem is just to get more technology. Um, and we haven't been able to capitalize on it. I mean, there's no difference than, you know, taking your smartphone and buying it just to make phone calls. But no, you're supposed to be able, that's the point of it, is to be able to do so much more with it, right? So you might as well just go back to a flip phone then. Yeah. What's the point? And the same thing with SAP. And I think SAP, just to be clear, their S4 product is fabulous, right? And where it's going technologically is, is the, the correct direction with the Forborn Industry 4.0, right? No question about it. But I think the maturity of organizations haven't necessarily matched the technology yet. And so then there's a question of what do we do to get there? And I believe it's something we spoke about earlier when we talked about return on investment versus return on asset. I think it's because a lot of people haven't necessarily seen SAP as an asset. I think people still see it just as a tool. Right. It's just something I have to put data into so that it spits something out on the other side that I may or may not listen to, you know, as a planner. But from a financial point of view, at least I'm getting my finances. But that's also not true because finance is probably journal entering like crazy, got some spreadsheets to plug in a bunch of things and does month end on the side, right? It's like, so the integration is lost in this whole thing. And so the asset, the smartphone, if you want, right, isn't utilized to the right, to the fullest extent. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, tons of examples of that, right? I, you know, I've met through my role at, at ASUG, I get to meet a lot of executives for our members. And it's, uh, it's often surprising to me uh, how many companies run a significant portion of their business with Excel right. as their ERP system or as their, e their EMS system or as whatever system, right? Um, you know, I, I can't imagine that, uh, that if they really kind of broke that down and say, you know, holy cow, look where, look where we're spending our money versus where we're spending our effort. You know, this is probably not the most uh, sound way to operate. Right. It's, not, it's not the most scalable for sure, True. right? True. Yeah, we refer to those as personal information systems. You know, everybody's got squirreled away a little spreadsheet yeah. somewhere. Yeah, and we've all been to that meeting where, you know, everybody walks in, they've got their own version of the truth <laughs> right. on their own spreadsheet, right? Where, where do you get that number? Well, you know, because mine says something else, right? Yeah, I think that's so true. And I, and I love this notion, especially because since we're talking supply chain, right? And most of the audience is probably going to be somebody in the supply chain, uh, you know, let's switch away from the smartphone concept and just think about this, right? So if you're, you know, you've got a plant, you're running effectively as, as best you can, you have a new bottleneck, you decide, you know what, the best way to release this bottleneck is to purchase a new asset. So you go out, you do your research, and you spend 10, 20, 30 million dollars on this piece of equipment. And guess what happens? You're running 10, 15 percent utilization through it somebody's probably going to be asking a few questions around that, right? The whole point of an asset is to maximize it, to sweat the asset. You know, you don't need necessarily 100%, but you want to be able to produce closer to 80%. And I think if you think of it again back in the context of that continuum, right, if you're kind of stuck in that one to two range, you're probably using SAP 15, 20, 30% of its capabilities. And to truly move to that, agile state, that optimal state, you need to be pushing 60 to 80%. That's the only way to see it. And, and I think that's what's going to transform companies now. 
either going into S4 or pre-S4, either way, it's like starting to say, how do I actually change the mindset to see this as an asset, not just an expense? Absolutely, absolutely. And so, you know, looking at this continuum that you're describing and talking about how do I move from, you know, kind of an operational process to, to an effective operational efficiency to this agility model, um, you know, what are, are there, are there some kind of clear steps for companies? Is it, is it a one-off situation? Is everybody kind of on their own? How do people start on that journey? I mean, we've talked about it's not purely a technology play. Right. Technology certainly part, plays a part in that, but it's not purely a technology play. How do, how do companies address this? How do they, how do they start to eat this elephant? <laughs> I love the analogy, by the way. You know, you know, being from South Africa, that really resonates. Um, so I think the, there are a handful of steps. Uh, I think it comes down to one, are we honest about where we are on the continuum? You know, one through five. You can't really figure out what that next step is until you know where you're at. And I think being honest and measuring yourself is really key to do that. I think the second step is, is to start saying, look, don't think of SAP, the, the, the future state, and it could be just IBP or it could be, you know, some other module, right? Don't just think of it as the, the way to move forward because it could just end up being lipstick on a pig if you don't address some of the behaviors, the processes, the data integrity. Yeah, to your point, point, bad process on a faster system is just a bad process faster. Right. So. An, an automated faster <laughs> chaos, right? I agree, and, and, and I think data integrity is probably the key one, right? Here's the other thing. Everybody's talking about machine learning, AI, you know, circular economies, slot size of one, all these cool things, right? But guess what? They're all dependent on data. Every one of these things depend on the quality of the data. Coming back to our smartphone analogy, you're, not, you're using it because it's providing you with accurate data that you can trust. Same thing with SAP. So again, if you're kind of in that lower end of that maturity, and you're not using SAP and you don't trust the data, it doesn't really matter which technology. So I would say step number two is take care of your house. Start with some kind of housekeeping. Just take care of your core processes and let's look at what that looks like. So that would be kind of like step number two, I would say. Uh, step number three is, is to start thinking about these personal information systems as, as um, almost an evil, if you want, right? Because these spreadsheets, they break the integration. The whole thing that SAP was designed to be, right? It was designed that if I do something on this end, I can see the result of it instantaneously on the other side. As soon as I take the data out and I manipulate it over here and I give it back to SAP and SAP is a little confused and I go like, where did this come from? And that doesn't reflect what I have. And then somebody else takes it and manipulates it. Not only are you slowing down the process, you're actually confusing the results that SAP is producing. You know, simple example, right? You can look at lead times. You know, if the system thinks the lead time to get product from A to B is 10 days, but I know it's 20 and I'm managing all of that in my spreadsheet over here, right? And I say, okay, now let's go buy it. SAP's gonna go, well, hold on. It should be here 10 days early. And you, you know, why did you put it 20 days out, right? Simple things, that's basics, but that's the relevance of it. And so machine learning and AI is gonna go nowhere without a core foundation. And I think, if you think of digital transformation, which is the buzzword now, everybody's hung up on that, is it starts with, it doesn't necessarily start with new technology, it starts with the fact that the data is in a system. In a system, a single source of truth. That's the first step of any digital transformation. And most companies have been running this first step for the last 30 years in some form of ERP. They have it. So now let's create a solid foundation from there. Now you, you what I keep hearing in my head as you go through the, your, your steps and, you, and you're describing the process there right. is this idea of, of really process discipline is ultimately what, what yes. makes this successful or not. Yes. Uh, you know, and I, I keep thinking back to, to my past experience and, and conversations I've had with other, other ASUG members where there is inevitably at some level within the organization, there is, there is somebody who, you know, hey, are you going to trust the numbers that came out of our system or my 30 years of experience? And you know that tribal, tribal knowledge. That tribal knowledge is ultimately the 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 block or the challenge that that is is keeping you from moving into this more model of uh, agility that we're talking about. I hundred percent right, and it comes back to what you taught. You said process excellence. We often refer to it as transactional excellence because the transactions, in many ways, is your process if you're using the right best practice. 
Um, but it's exactly the same thing is how do you make sure you've got the excellence in place? Then, as you said, the discipline to wrap around it. I can't review my master data once a year because my supplies change, lead times change, hiccups, you know, I have logistical issues, things happen. So I need to adjust my rules continuously. So how do you create the discipline in the process to adjust those rules frequently? And which is what brings you the agility to your earlier point, which comes back to one of the topics, you know, the points I made earlier about instead of SNOP, the SNOE, right? The sales and operations execution. Do we have that down pat? If we have that down pat, almost everything from there becomes agile because I can now, literally, I can now have an SNOP process and say, you know what, we're gonna free up some capacity, I'm gonna move this plant to this plant and adjust my stuff. And whatever drops into the execution system, they just follow. You know, the agility is built in. So we've been kind of hinting around this and, and you've made some examples to, through our conversation, but you know, at the end of the day, uh, the, the supply chain excellence and supply chain agility is ultimately about being able to deliver better business outcomes. And so I want to, I want to talk about that and kind of what do you see as sort of the, what's the payoff here for, for organizations? So there's a couple of things. I think we need to think of it in, from a technology perspective, process perspective, and business perspective. Um, so from a technology perspective, if you're able to kind of level set your organization, raise the maturity of that process, discipline, and excellence you mentioned, you're doing, you're doing yourself a real favor in being able to start determining the blueprint for your S4HANA journey, as opposed to maybe a greenfield option where you start from scratch and you hope this time it will be different. You know, we all know what hope's not a strategy, yeah, right? Yeah. And um, if you go to the user community that's used to doing it one way and say, hey, how would you like the process design? Guess what? They're going to tell you how it was, yeah. right? So maybe a way to change it is to readjust it now and then use it as a blueprint. By doing that, you're actually also reducing the cost of the s transition because instead of maybe my, uh, greenfielding, you may brownfield now. You may be able to say, okay, now that this is good enough, I can take the processes, the data, and all of that knowledge into S4. So massive savings there. Uh, we've seen companies save as much as 50% of their s budget by migrating a, a, a mature ECC to an S4 versus greenfielding it. Just Interesting. And, and, and much less change management, by the way. Oh, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Uh, process side, so the second one, process benefits. So suddenly you start having much more visibility you can create a lot more automation. And what we like to think of it is, is process and people kind of together is you're rising above the transactions. So now you can actually let the system do most of the work for you, the heavy lifting if you want, and really allow the organization with that tribal knowledge that they have to really adjust the rules. So the, the process performance that comes out of that is amazing. Um, SAP is exceptionally good at trying to manage what you plan to do, what you said you're gonna do, and then what you actually did. And it's constantly trying to match these two. And what you want is these three things to be perfectly aligned. Never the, always perfectly the case, but the further apart they are, the weaker your process is. The closer the part they are, the stronger your process is. And then I would say the, the, the third thing around business benefits, and, and we've seen this pre-S4 HANA days, right? Is that if you can actually change this maturity mindset to say, how do I see this as an asset? and actually raise the level of this asset. Um, what we have found is companies have seen oh, significant improvements in customer service levels. Suddenly ATP works for them. It's actually gonna be part of the series. We're gonna have somebody talking about how do you actually make a promise and keep a promise, right? We've seen uh, throughput improvements, manufacturing throughput through operational excellence. And that's actually gonna be a topic as well in this series to say, what can I do with SAP to actually show increased throughput improvement, right? We've seen inventory savings. We've seen turns go up as high as 20, 30, 35%. Because when you're suddenly actually buying the right stuff, making the right stuff, only what you need, and you become a true pool system, your inventory turns improve. And, and I think that's going to be one of the third options on the series too, is to say, how do we actually see an optimization in our inventory. Not necessarily reduction, S may mean reduction in some, but ultimately from a capital spend perspective. And then outside of the fact that you now suddenly have happy users because they actually enjoy going to work and enjoy user system, right? 
they feel more in, um, empowered, they feel more of, a, more of a purpose. So that's the ancillary benefit, but a massive benefit when you start thinking of it to a business, especially if you think of culture, right? Everybody's talking about culture. The pandemic threw culture upside down on its head, right? Instead of this, we were doing it over a screen. And how do you do that over a screen? So culture is a massive part, and this actually helps raise the level of culture. And then the last one I'd say around the business benefit is this whole ESG, right? Everybody's about the environment and about the, the social and governance responsibility as companies have nowadays. And if you start getting some of these things right that I mentioned earlier, and you start actually becoming more agile, reducing the operational cost, your ESGs are going through the roof, right? Your environmental carbon footprint is reducing. Yep. You're starting to see social and cultural improvements. So, I mean, it just be, it becomes a bit of a no-brainer after all. Fantastic. Yeah, so, you know, as you were going through that, I was reminded of uh, a lesson that I learned very early in my, my work experience from, a, from an old mentor of mine. Um, you know, he told me one day, he said, you've got to always be careful not to let the $10 an hour people do the $5 an hour job. <laughs> it's so true, right? And, you know, it's really easy to overlook that. And obviously, you can, you can tell from the prices. I learned that many years ago when those, <laughs> were, those, those felt like good pay, pay rates. But um, to be able to understand, and, you know, and, and the technology makes it even that much more challenging, right? You know, don't, don't take one of your key human assets and make them a slave to managing a spreadsheet. You know, leverage the technology to integrate the process that you define, to leverage and then let the people do the jobs that you can't automate, right? Let them actually be able to apply true innovative skill and innovative thought around how the system can run better versus, you know, let me feed the machine. Let me feed the machine, yeah. Don't be slave to the machine. Yeah, let it do it. And, and I would say that was true back then. It is as true as today. It hasn't changed. The basic principles of physics haven't changed as much as we have invented unbelievable technologies. The foundational principles haven't changed, and that's true for supply chains. Fundamental principles around how to use a supply chain, how to function a supply chain, what are those steps, how do we use data, the fundamentals around data, all of that hasn't changed. And I think that's at the, at the heart of it, right, is raising the people's level of using the tool, you know, empowering them to be more productive rather than getting them stuck and sitting there for four hours capturing data or correcting data, right? And so... You mentioned something I want to come back to, right? It, it, you know, during the introductory remarks, I made the comment, this is the first of a series of events around supply chain. And you talked about some of the ones that are coming up. Um, and you gave us a little insight to what's coming up in the next few sessions. I want to come back to that because we're really touching on some very key topics and very key challenge areas for customers. Again, and it's not ERP platform dependent. It's, right. it's you know, whether you're running R3, you're running S4. You know, heaven forbid they're running it on SAP solution, you still face the same challenges, right? And so just let's kind of go back over those again. I want to touch on sort of the next okay. the next couple of sessions. Yeah. yeah, I think that's key because you know, this is a supply chain conversation. And and again, if we define supply chain the way we do, that is at the heart of most businesses. So this is actually a business conversation then. Um, so I think the as we go through the series, we're we're talking about turning SAP into an asset, one, right? How do we start thinking about it in that way? How do we actually use it in a way that actually we can start seeing a return on this asset, right? Um, so a couple things in that area. Uh, I think it's first off, it's going to start off around how do we get some of our manufacturing efficiencies out of the way, right? Operational excellence. You know, how do we start seeing throughput improvements? How do we have more visibility on constraints? How do we deal with those constraints? And how do we capacity level? You know. If you're fortunate enough, the pandemic rushed you with a whole bunch of demand and you didn't have enough capacity to deal with. So how do we adjust that? How do we become agile in that space to deal with this demand, right? If you were possibly on the flip side and you, your demand dropped, you may be sitting with too much inventory, right? And so one of the conversations the series is going to be is how do you optimize that? Now, whether demand goes up or down doesn't matter. You need to be able to adjust, turn it up and down. Right now, sometimes we have supplier constraints. We've seen it where, you know, supplies have gone out of business and suddenly you need multi-sourcing and how do you address that? And of course, those are some of the practical things. But then how do you take that practical thing, the physical thing, put it into the digital system, i.e. SAP, and make it mimic that process? That digital twin that everybody keeps talking about is how does that, that process 
actually should work based on what's physically happening in the system. And so we're going to talk a little bit about inventory optimization, some of the techniques to use. And then lastly, of course, one of the most important ones is how do I make a promise and keep a promise? Uh, you know, the old ATP available to promise, s 4 has got advanced ATP, APO had global ATP, there's all these different ATPs that exist. But at the end of the day, ATP says, I can tell the customer at any given time when they're going to get their product, you know, and I can adjust those dates and communicate to the customer, but more importantly, meet that date. I mean, this is the sad part, right? In the last 10 odd years, we've all become very used to Amazon as consumers. Yep. And we're very used to as a prime member to go on and order something and expect it the next day. Okay. Now, if you or can't or get it the, the next day, <laughs> or even the same yeah. day, right? Even <laughs> that's pretty amazing sometimes, right? Again, supply chain agility, yep. for sure, right? And obviously inventory at the right places. But what happens if they don't have it available? They come back and say, I don't have it now, but in, in, on April 30, uh, 28th, you'll get it. And you got to make that decision. And if you say, fine, click. You'll be okay to wait. If that's a product you want and they're giving you a date. But come hell or high water, on April 28th, you're going to expect it. And I think that has become, even though we're consumers, that's become definitely a part of the expectation of supply chains now. Is that... Don't just give me a fixed lead time and say, you're going to give it to me in two days. And then all you do is you just cause havoc on your side and the cost is chaotic and everything to try and just meet those two days. Just give me an actual date, something I can trust. And ATP is that tool, but without a predictable supply chain, exactly. I can't promise that. I, uh, I had an opportunity this past weekend to go to dinner with a good friend of mine that's, that's still in uh, distribution. And that's the biggest challenge that his company is facing right now is unreliable ATP numbers. He didn't express it that way, but that's right. the challenge, right? That, you know, I make a promise to a customer, you can have this material on X date. Right. The next date rolls around and the material's not there. And, you know, it really drives home. I always told my, my people when I was uh, in sales management, back before I got an IT, I said, there's kind of three levels, right? The best thing you can tell customers is good news. I've got your stuff and it's here now or whatever the case may be. The second best thing you can tell them is bad news. Right. It's not going to be here today, but it's going to be here in a week. At least you can plan around that. To your point, I, I'm, I'm having, to, I'm changing with the promises, right. but I'm, I'm going to be able to keep this promise. But the worst thing you do is give them no information, right? right. Because at that point, they have to assume the worst. And, and and I would say probably on top of no information is bad information. Yes. Give them something at a date that's not 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 true. You know it. They know it. It's just that's just right. as bad, right? I agree. And un and unfortunately, when it comes to agility, we're moving into a space now where that's expected. You, you, got, you got to give me a date that I can trust because supply chains isn't just about your business and your end-to-end -end four walls. If you think of the macro supply chain, I'm just a supplier to another company who's a supplier to another company who's a supplier to another company, right? And that macro supply chain, you can see the ripple effect, yeah. right? And just think of the waste. Every time this one's constantly doing that, I've just had more inventory, more costs, more capital, more expense, more CO2. At every, every handshake, I'm just creating more cost and waste. And so each one is really about that ownership and responsibility to say, what can I do to the, to the macro world? Hey, Martin, this has been a lot of fun today. This is, uh, it's always great to be able to talk to a good friend, uh, to yes. talk about a topic that, uh, that I'm near and dear to coming from the supply chain myself. Uh, I think that uh, we've really covered a lot of good stuff today. I'm really looking forward to the next sessions we have in this series. Uh, and I'll be talking about those here more in a minute uh, and let people know how to consume those. But really excited about what we're bringing to the ASIC membership and, and to help them. Again, let's sweat that asset, right? Let's get the Absolutely. most out of your SAP technology investment. No, it's, no, it's been so a pleasure, fantastic. Dave. Thank you very much. Good seeing you. So again, thank you, Martin, for your time and insights around the world of supply chain. I really enjoy when my role here at ASUG allows me to take part in discussions like this, and it is especially enjoyable when the topic lets me relive some of my own experiences from wholesale distribution. It's fun to be able to look back at how we used to do things and see how this space has progressed and frankly, how we could have done things better. Now, today's discussion does not end here today. Please join ASUG as we continue our ASUG Present series on supply chain with four more sessions over the coming weeks. 
In session two, Christy Bain, associate partner and advisor at Reveal, will take us on a deeper dive into using your SAP system to drive manufacturing and operational excellence. In session three, Sean Alif, senior partner at Reveal, will dig into inventory optimization and turns management. In session four, Christy Bain will rejoin us and provide insights around inventory planning in MRP and ATP. Now for each of these sessions, we'll follow this live, the, the same speaker chat format that we had for today and that the speaker will be available in the chat and you can really engage in the conversation as it unfolds. The last session of this series to cap the season off will be with Mark LeClaire, the CIO at GE Current Mark will join Martin Rowan and me for a live candid discussion on how GE Current has been able to maximize the value of their SAP investment to manage their supply chain operations. Thank you all for your time today. It's been a real delight kicking this series off and I look forward to hearing from you and seeing you as we continue this series. Thank you to our wonderful speakers for this wonderful presentation. We're gonna go ahead and get started with the Q&A now. Please feel free to send in any questions you have. Fantastic. Well, great, great. I mean, it's an interesting session to be able to see this, right? This is, uh, uh, if you ever want kind of a weird out of body experience, watch yourself in a presentation like we just did, like I just had the opportunity to do. Uh, but uh, Martin and I are here. Obviously, we've been in, in the chat. And uh, thank you all for your, for your, there's been some great questions that have come in. We've got a few of them we want to go through. Uh, and again, feel free to, uh, to continue uh, throwing things into the chat, uh, uh, throw things in the QA. Uh, so uh, uh, first, real just couple, a couple of logistics questions, right? So one, is there a recording? Absolutely. This is available on demand to ASUG members. So literally you can, even if you've got people in your team that haven't signed up for this, uh, they can go in this afternoon, tomorrow, whenever, uh, and sign up and, and watch the entirety of this presentation again. Uh, it is, again, it's available as a, as a member benefit. So please take advantage of that. Uh, also, and Martin, I'm going to ask you to, to jump in on this. Uh, there's a couple of questions from the audience about getting a copy of that slide with the with the five-step maturity model that you presented earlier. Yeah, absolutely. What I can do is uh, maybe in the chat I'll put our um, website with the actual link on it because it's actually on our website at revealvalue.com and then under uh, the menu option of solutions and specifically it's called business maturity. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll definitely comment on that and add that uh, on there because I think that's excellent. And you can print it straight from the website. So that's that's a great uh, call Perfect. out. Perfect. So Sandeep, I don't know if, if you want to, yeah, and if you, if you have trouble running that, just follow it with me, uh, david.waskmedasug.com. We'll make sure that, that, that we make that available to everybody. Um, so, you know, looking at, obviously this is something we didn't record earlier today, right? It's, it's, a, it's been a couple of weeks ago. And, and we continue to see ongoing challenges to supply chain, right? So. Uh, there's the the ongoing challenges with uh, with the, uh, the issues in in Ukraine, right? And you know specifically around supply chain, uh, a lot of yep. countries are being impacted around wheat and, and kind of how to manage through that. Uh, you're driving maybe closer to the U.S. Um, uh, challenges around uh, uh, baby formula, right? Where now it was it was almost a self-imposed uh, supply chain disruption, right? Or where what turned out to be the primary manufacturer uh, was unable to manufacture for a period of time. Right. And of course, the, the <laughs> one that everybody's feeling at this point, let's say, unless they typically walk wherever they go, is um, gas prices and understanding how that impacts right. everybody, right? Um, and so, uh, would love to get your thoughts on on some of, you know, again, how, how these continue to feed this idea of, of developing a more agile, more responsive supply chain and supply chain management solution. Yeah, David, I think it gets to the point where I think we need to now realize that disruptions are just part of life. And yes, you're going to have big ones, pandemics are big ones, um, you know, suppliers going out of business, those are big ones, right, that we have to deal with. But I think that's going to continue to be a reality. I mean, who would have thought that we'd be um, in a war situation in Europe um, anytime soon, you know, exactly. so I think I think that's really it. And And so... The resilience concept that everybody talks about, CNN, Fox, you name it, everybody talks about having a resilient supply chain is, is good, but it really doesn't deal with these kind of challenges, right? And, and some of them are physical and you can't do much about it. I mean, so we, let's not pretend that, you know, the system is going to be able to solve all our problems. Right. Uh, however, being able to react and kind of see ahead by looking at some of the reactionary kind of exceptions or proactive kind of um, situations to deal with, that's what makes us more agile 
so that we can adapt, so we can add multiple sources to our supply or be able to switch production from, from one country to another and, and do that fairly quickly. I think that's that's going to continue to be the case. So I think if you start thinking about supply chain professionals, I think the career definition has changed. Uh, it's, you can't just be just good at what you do. You're going to have to have critical thinking. You're going to have to understand the system backwards. And you're going to have to really understand your, your process um, and, of course, the market very well. I mean, it's, it's truly is going to become a, a professional a profession that's going to require some serious skills. Absolutely. So some great questions coming into the uh, coming into the Q and A. I want to I want to cover as many of these as we can in the time we have left, right? So so one that uh, that I, I find very interesting, right? Because it actually ties into the, the idea of the supply chain series, right? And so one is uh, specifically, can you give some example manufacturers, maybe their customers you've worked with, or maybe just people you know that have been able to kind of kind of make this SAP as an asset asset journey and. And again, I'm, 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 I'm like it because it allows us to plug kind of what's going to actually be coming up as part of the series. So, Yeah, let me actually, one comes to mind uh, just quickly that I think would be really helpful for people to understand. And it also talk him through how they dealt with it being an agile com company afterwards. So it's a manufacturer here in Chicago, just up the street from us. Um, they were under pressure by their parent company out of uh, Europe to say they got to improve their supply chain, they got to reduce inventories, they got to get working capital better aligned, etc. And they just realized very quickly that they weren't using SAP to the fullest extent. It was just a tool. The CFO was actually interesting enough, the first one to raise his hand and says, we need to do more, uh, which of course is very rare typically in, mm -hmm. in that space. So we got in, we helped them, and uh, within six months, they were able to truly utilize the system in a way that allowed their business to just be functioned so much more effectively. Um, and, and they were able to not only meet those working capital reduction needs that uh, the European parent company put on them, they also saw a, a huge uh, increase in their service levels. So now, so that was immediate, right? Within 12 months, they got to see some amazing results because they literally transformed that mindset around using this tool effectively. But here's the best part. Fast forward two years later, a pandemic hits. These guys make manufacturing, uh, make cleaning equipment and cleaning chemicals. So guess which one had a demand increase and which one had a mm -hmm. demand decrease, right? So the equipment started reducing pretty quickly in demand, and everybody was like, I'm not, I don't need the equipment, but I definitely need the chemicals. And they were able to, within four weeks, to literally adjust the dials in the system, change the demand, change the planning strategies, change the production schedules, change everything, and pivot and be able to capitalize on the pandemic to the point where they outgrew, out, outpaced their growth projections uh, pretty radically over the last three years because of that. And of course, as things have become back to, to quote unquote normal again, you know, they've been able to adjust. So, a great example, actually, of somebody using the tool mm -hmm. to really capitalize on, on the change. And that's because of agility. Four weeks. Most companies have taken a year to two years to make these changes. Yeah. And, of course, another another great example, and this is going to be actually part of the series. So, so set, you know, episode five of the series will actually be a, a deep dive uh, with you, me, and uh, Mark LeClaire, the CIO at GE Current. Yep. I'm a member. A uh, longtime friend of me, uh, but he, in their work at GE Current, what they've done to be able to, to, to around transformation and be able to look at SAP as an asset, and how that's impacted their business. Uh, our session five is going to be going through that story and, frankly, giving people a chance to, you know, to hear it right from from I'll, I'll call Mark the horse from the more the horse's mouth, right? Uh, and, and to work, work what hasn't worked, and to be able to ask questions, right? And that's you know again to be able to bring that value to the community from an ASIC standpoint, to be able to get answers to people to help them make better decisions. Uh, so, the, I mean, great story for us to be able to hear uh, in that session five as well. Yeah, and I think the nice part about that one too, David, I think it's great calling it out, is that they did that in the pandemic. Yep. So they made that change and shift while things were going on. So that's that's a great story. So a couple of questions as people start looking at this and, and you know, you can tie it back to the maturity model or some of the conversations we had around, you know, transactional excellence to, to agility. Um, you know, a lot of companies have been doing this for a long time. Frankly, one of the one of the primary reasons that people put in SAP back many years ago was to manage supply chain, right? Um, and so, as we talk about these these mindset changes and, and you know underlying technology changes, uh, what's the biggest 
challenge that you see people deal with, right? Is it is it is it around change management? Is it around uh, skills development? Is it around technology? Kind of kind of what's the hangup? What are the, what ends up being the the stumbling block? You know, it it is the old adage of people process technology, right? Sadly, I don't think that's really changed. Um, but what we have found, most companies have a pretty decent SAP system implemented. Um, the the challenge is, is that over you know time, you know they start using less of it, or start customizing it, or you know it just becomes less of what it was designed to do. We also find that most companies' processes, if they use the system effectively, are pretty decent. Where the breakdown typically comes is exactly what you just mentioned around change management. Is usually people just go, I, you know, we've been doing it this way for the longest time. You know, we work with the U.S. Navy, who's been doing, you know, business, like, you know, for a hundred years the same way, right? Uh, you've got multiple companies that are or have been doing it a certain way and they believe that that's the uniqueness. And so a big challenge to tell people is that your uniqueness isn't how you create a purchase order or how you create a production order or how you do a good receipt. Your uniqueness comes in how agile are you to react to your customer's needs, right? It's, you know, we've all, no, I, I use this example in the talk about Amazon, right? You know, if Amazon gives us a date, you know, we will decide whether we accept it. But if we accept it, we accept it. So making a promise and keeping a promise is probably the biggest uh, competitive advantage nowadays. Um, you know, quality, cost delivery, you know, as we mentioned earlier, is, is table stakes. It's, it's, it might be agile enough. And, and I think that change management is the key. So we find that about 70% of such a transformation is actually around getting the people educated and aligned around the new way of doing things. Right. And again, that comes back to, you know, one of the themes we talked about, this is not purely a technology conversation, right? I mean, technology plays a part of it, but again, putting in new software, if you don't do anything else, you just make bad process run faster. So. Yeah. hundred percent. And we're talking about business planners, buyers, customer service, you know, real people yeah. doing real work. How do yeah. they think differently about it? Right. So, so last question from looking at the clock, I want to make sure we that we respect everyone's yep. time today. Uh, is there one measure, maybe like here's the, you know, if I if I had one metric to choose from and I'm trying to evaluate my company around that maturity level, is there one thing I can look at and say, hey, I'm I'm actually, I really am a financial company, or I really am not, and this is how I know. Yeah. I, I think if you think of scoreboard kind of measures, you, you, there's there's probably two, right? And and that is your inventory, you know, what are my turns and are they getting any better? But more importantly, I would say to the one I just mentioned, which is making a promise, keeping a promise, on time in full. Um, and not to, not to the, necessarily always to the promise, but also to the requested date. Um, you, know, you know, when the customer actually requested it. And then that little negotiation that you have with, well, I can only do it in a week's time, do we agree? And then whatever we then agree, that's what we make. So I think that's probably the single biggest scoreboard metric is, is that kind of make a promise, keep a promise. However, there's a lot of, like baseball, there's a lot of kind of leading indicators to tell you if you're going to have a good game or not. You know, do we have good ra uh, run batting uh, um, averages and, and how are we doing with our runs and stuff? And I think for from a supply chain perspective, that's the supply chain health-related metric. So you know, to what extent am I dealing with the exceptions of the day in that day? How many of them are rolling over to the next day? How many are rolling over to the next week? How many are rolling over to the next month? And then suddenly it becomes so overwhelming that I actually just feel like I, I can't be ahead. And so to remain agile and to be able to remain that kind of competitive, create the competitive edge, you have to be on top of those exceptions that occur within that day. So I think the other single biggest metric on a daily basis is, is am I getting through my exceptions in a day? If not, right. we're going to fall behind. As simple as that. Fantastic. And that's a, I think that's probably a great way to wrap. I know, you know, in my in my experience as a customer, that was that was very near and dear to our heart. We manage from an inventory standpoint, we're very conscious about managing to an inventory performance, a service level. And, right. and so we had very, very particular rules and requirements that we did. Hey, if, it, if this is good for us again from distribution, hey, if this is a, an A or a B item, we expected to be able to meet customer demand, you know, 99% of the time, right? And so we, we were willing to make the investment, willing to make the make the decisions around that. And then for for slower moving, less regular, less common items, we we have lower service levels. But 
Um, but again, it was all driven around to your point to be able to, to, to make and keep a promise to the customer. Exactly right. So Martin, great conversation. We're really looking forward to uh, to the, the rest of the series. And, and for the attendees today, thank you for your time. Thank you for your input. Uh, check us out at asug.com. Uh, you know, these events are up and, and you know, you can register for them. We've got a lot of people that are signed up for these. We're looking forward to continuing the conversation. Uh, if you have any additional questions, you can reach out to us at, the, at uh, you know, just reach out to me personally, david.wascom at asug.com. Um, you can also reach us through uh, uh, asug express at, uh, at asug.com. Um, but uh, please don't, don't leave your questions unanswered. That's, that's, you know, our mission is to help you and your company get the most from your SAP technology investment. And the way we do that is make sure that we're connecting you with the right topics in the right community so you can have and share ideas with other peers to understand how things work. So yeah, that's perfect. Martin, thank you again. Thank you for the attendees today. Yeah. Uh, we will uh, we will see you again on the next one. Appreciate it. Hey, perfect. Thanks, David. Good seeing you. All right. Bye everybody.